Well, I think we can go ahead and get started. We have lots of folks online um, and it's good to see everybody online and a special welcome to those of you who are here in person. It's always, it's, um, I, I, I don't know about you, but every day now you come to, you come to school and you see more and more people and we're getting back slowly but surely. And it's just, it's just wonderful to see. And it's great that we can be here together to celebrate a wonderful, uh, wonderful event. So let me, before I introduce our esteemed speaker in a very she-she mess, uh, which he can, he can uh, explain to us uh, later, um, I do want to recognize what brings us here today. As you know, the Dean's Lecture Series was established to highlight the extraordinary work of our faculty who are newly uh, appointed um, as professors or, or um, promoted to professors. Attaining this appointment represents an exceptional achievement by a senior faculty member and confirms not only the respect um, and high regard of the school, but also of colleagues around the nation and indeed around the world. Today we have a speaker who embodies the best of the Bloomberg School and I will add this field of public health. Dr. Professor Alain Labrique uh, is here with us today to to um, give his Dean's Lecture. Dr. Labrique is an infectious disease epidemiologist, a community trialist, and a globally recognized leader in using mobile and digital technologies to strengthen health systems in a resource limited, in resource limited And I see he's brought some props with us, so this should be an interesting uh, talk. Um, more than 150 uh, projects across every division of the university are linked through the JHU Global M Health Initiative, which Dr. Labrique founded back in 2012. He also leads one of the university's largest field research sites in Bangladesh, heading a team of hundreds of field staff to study ways to reduce infant and maternal mortality. Dr. Labrique likes to describe himself as a techno geek, but I would add that he is a visionary. Years ago, he began to wonder if mobile phones could advance uh, public health work that we do. At the time, the concept was a bit out of outside the box, but of course, that's a place with it where Alain feels quite comfortable. As the number of cell phones in the developing world began to skyrocket, he saw possibilities, endless possibilities, like a text message system that could be bring skilled healthcare workers to home births in Bangladesh. From those very early days, he became a leading scientist and an advocate in the fields of mobile and digital health, advancing its design, architecture use, and very importantly, its evaluation. Today, digital health is a central approach in improving public health, public health and public health systems, one that is present in just about every uh, department here at the Bloomberg School and across the public health field at large. That is a sea change that Alain helped to begin and one that he has worked tirelessly to foster. Currently, uh, Alain um, is, serves on the faculty of the Global Disease Epidemiology and Control or GDEC program in the Department of International Health. <clears throat> he also holds joint appointments in nursing, medicine, and engineering. He has a master's degree in molecular biology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and a master's and a PhD in epidemiology right here from the Bloomberg School of Public Health. He completed his field work as a research fellow at the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research in Bangladesh. One of the most highly cited researchers in digital health, Dr. Labrique received a top 11 in 2011 Innovator Award from the Rockefeller and UN Foundation. In 2018, he received the Excellence in International Public Health Practice Award from our own uh, uh, Bloomberg School of Public Health and a Distinguished Alumnus Award from the Johns Hopkins University. Many of you know, Ella is a dynamic and, and engaging teacher and a highly sought after mentor. He serves on numerous global advisory and governing bodies related to mobile and digital health. He has authored more than 200 peer reviewed publications, has given um, over 100 public lectures and invited keynotes and holds several patents. Now, something I did not know about Alain 
He is also, I'm told, the first person people turn to when they have a PowerPoint problem. Now, I'm not sure how widely you want this talent to be known. I wouldn't think so, so I apologize. But it's something I will not forget. Um, it's something we could all use at, at uh, any given point in time. Now, as some of you know, Alain was born in Bangladesh not long after its war for independence. During his childhood, he witnessed famine and a country struggling to survive. Those experiences forever shaped him. They made him want to help people living in poverty. At the Bloomberg School of Public Health, Alain strives every day in pursuit of that goal. He has improved the health and saved the lives of mothers and children and done so on a pretty grand scale. Now, of course, he's still committed to chasing new and bold ideas, and he continues to surprise us. He does surprise me when he comes to me with his new ideas. His innovations are pu pushing the boundaries of what is possible in mobile and digital health, in, and in many ways, he's redefining our field of public health. Professor Labrik, welcome. Uh, we are honored to have you here with us today. We are so honored to have you on our faculty here at the School of Public Health. And congratulations on all that you have done and all that you, we can't even imagine what he will do in the future. So Alain, the floor is all yours. And that's your phone, I think. Well, I have to say that's a, a very, very generous and extremely difficult introduction to uh, to follow. But, uh, you know, I wondered at times whether my PowerPoint skills was what was keeping me on the faculty, but it's nice to know that there's more to it than that. It's really a, such an honor and privilege to be with you here today. Thank you, Ellen, for the kind invitation and, and Becky for arranging all of the logistics. Um, it means a lot for, for me to, to see all of you in person who are braving uh, Omicron and BA2 and post-pandemic social anxiety to be here in person. It, it really means a lot. Um, I do want to take a moment, though, as, as I start to pause uh, for the very unexpected loss of our dear colleague and, and beacon of, of global health, uh, Paul Farmer, who passed away unexpectedly yesterday uh, in Rwanda. In preparation for this lecture, I, I thought a lot about the opportunity to share insights and, and whatever wisdom I may have gained over my career so far, perhaps share a few of the many, many adventures that I've been fortunate to have. But most importantly, I wanted to recognize and acknowledge that I stand here today because of the support and hard work of many, many people to whom I owe an unpayable debt of gratitude. We're all in this together, and these are not my, but our accomplishments. I, I cannot name all of you today, uh, but I've leaned on many of you heavily at times over the years, and you've made this journey uh, worthwhile and possible. Uh, before I begin, I, I hope you'll bear with me for a few moments as I acknowledge some truly important people. I wanna give a special thanks to uh, Lena Khan, uh, Lee Wu, Kelsey Allen, and Diwakar Mohan, for their assistance with some last minute uh, data analytics for today's uh, talk. But first I want to acknowledge that we live in a time of, of great pain, loss and sacrifice. Having lost my father Benoit to COVID-19 just a few months ago, my family and I have felt our hearts torn by the same pain that is shared by millions around the globe. With your permission, I'd like to dedicate this lecture uh, to my father, who was always so proud of our work as public health professionals. As a young man, he left uh, on a journey of service to live and work in India, where he met my mother, and they forged a life together in the newborn country of Bangladesh, where I was born and which I consider home. They sacrificed so much to enable me to pursue my studies in the US, believing in this future possible. I also want to recognize here in the audience a pillar of support without whom I couldn't dream of being a professor in international health at Johns Hopkins University, Kimberly, my patient and loving wife and mother to my children, David and Natalie, held down the fort while I flew from Santiago to Dhaka to Cape Town to Seattle to Geneva for four to six months every year for the past two decades, making sure that bills were paid and children fed and clothed and uh, driven to chorus and kung fu and all while being a leader in the community, founding one of the first scouts BSA all-girl troops in the country 
also and serving as a, as, a, as a deacon in the church. So none of the work that you hear about today would have been possible without her at my side. And uh, David and Natalie, my two incredible kids whose hugs and silly jokes keep me fueled when I'm most tired. And Natalie is here today. Uh, she got out of school a little early, thanks to this, uh, because I thought she should be here. One of her early ambitions as a five-year-old was to be a professor of M Health. My name's Natalie I'm a Greek, a professor at Johns Hopkins University. And now today, I'm going to talk about M Health. First, about M Health, you need to be healthy. Right, Papa? <laughs> You know, I couldn't have you here without embarrassing you a little bit, so. I wanted to acknowledge also one of my many mentors who made it possible for me to be here today. Keith West, seen here serenading Princess Maha Chakri Sirindhorn and Dean Clagg during the Health Advisory Board visit to Bangladesh on board a F-28 Fokker Friendship <clears throat> turboprop aircraft to distract the Thai ambassador and the Royal Palace entourage from the fact that the flight engineers were swapping out engines with duct tape while trying to fly to the Jibita field site in the north. Before we gave up and then piled into an emergency convoy of uh, buses to drive the 10 hours to the north. There's many things that I've learned from Keith and one of which uh, to always keep in mind for those of you starting out in your fieldwork career are that plan A and B are often inadequate. You have a plan C and D as well. Uh, Keith took a chance on this uh, young grasshopper while still working on my PhD, sending me out to Bangladesh in 1999 for two years, that turned into eight, uh, to help build the Javita site in rural Bangladesh. I've tried to emulate and often fail to mirror his patient humility and fundamental kindness to everyone, but I still have a ways to go uh, to catch up to his guitar skills. But my career has been built together with hundreds of devoted field workers, supervisors, and technical staff in Bangladesh and around the world, without whose commitment to research excellence, none of this would be possible. I remember when I first returned to Baltimore as a new assistant professor after my first few years, I had my annual review with the chair then, who was Bob Black. And I was excitingly telling him about this new field of mobile health, which I was exploring, and how I had begun to identify a number of faculty potentially interested in launching a new center. He patiently listened and then nodded his head and said, you know, Alan, this is all well and good, but keep one foot firmly planted in real science, which I was not that naive. I understood as a kind suggestion that I was skirting the lunatic fringe of uh, global health. We pummeled ahead, working closely with Betty Jordan at School of Nursing, Larry Chang at School of Medicine, with the support of Mike Clagg, who corralled the deans of the School of Nursing and Medicine and Engineering, and we launched the Global M Health Initiative. And that was over 10 years ago. Today, we're going strong as a center recognized globally as the first academic center of excellence for digital health. Today, digital health features prominently in the strategy of our Department of International Health, as well as across the school, as Ellen mentioned, with 14 courses across four departments that include digital health in their curricula and over 1,800 hits on the JHSPH website. Across the university, we see this digital transformation with an ecosystem of centers and institutes looking at how digital and mobile innovations transform how we collect data, measure the health of populations, and improve clinical outcomes. As we're all data scientists in this room, the most exciting is to see the data. Pulled last week from our tracker, SAP and COES, and every year we've seen an incredible growth in the number of digital health projects. With 2022 only in its second month, I've counted a total of 96 projects to date with $47 million in grants across our school in digital health. Not all in our center, but certainly a, a good many. So sometimes it pays to skirt the lunatic fringe and hold the course, but how did we get here? So as a self-proclaimed uh, super geek, uh, I like to think of the origins of where we are today lies with visionaries like Gene Roddenberry, the man who in the 1960s came up with the idea of Star Trek. Here you see Commander Spock holding in his hand a piece of technology. There's enough gray hair in the room, I think, to, to remember what this is. Anyone? What's he holding in his hand? Close, close, it's a tricorder. 
a tricorder, a device that could, from the palm of your hand, I have one right there, uh, look up information, record images and video, communicate over long distances and measure vital signs. We all have one of these in our pockets today, 146 years from the very first phone call made by Alexander Graham Bell on something that looks a little bit like this one over here. How this has changed the world. A few years ago in the, in the before times, uh, when we were traveling almost every week, I found myself in rural Kibwezi, Kenya, in this small village without electricity. Scratched into this wall of this mud home was a number. It was not a census number, but a mobile phone number to reach this resident should they be out of their home. This revolution over the past decade has been transformative to the way the world works. Looking here at a map of the world with the boundaries of each country inflated to reflect the mobile phone subscriptions, we see how Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa are rapidly swelling, which is not surprisingly similar to the map of maternal and neonatal mortality burden. Could this be an overlap of challenge and opportunity? It's here in Bangladesh where I was born shortly after the terrible war of independence, the son of a Belgian diplomat and an Indian school teacher. My mother delivered me in a barely functional health facility in the post-war chaos. We both nearly became one of these statistics. I through obstructed labor, as you might imagine, uh, this big head, um, and she from postpartum sepsis. There were no stable communications. Land phones did not work. My father was on his bicycle, riding from clinic to clinic, to embassy to embassy, to scrounge together enough antibiotics to save her life. In Bangladesh today, despite major achievements in reducing maternal mortality, the rate of under five mortality remains around 30 per thousand live births. And a number that's hard to grasp, even for epidemiologists except when you realize that it means nearly 300 children dying every day. Bangladesh has been a challenging country for public health. Plagued by natural disasters and political instability, it has nonetheless been an exemplar for things like childhood immunizations, vitamin A campaigns, near universal primary education, with many JHU faculty launching or building their careers in collaboration with Bangladeshi scientists and institutions. Folks like David and Brad Sack, Abdullah Baki, Al Somer, Bob Black, Keith West, and countless students have studied global health in Bangladesh. It was in this beautiful country that Keith West, Al Somer, Parul Christian, Rolf Klam, Halida Akhtar, and a team of extraordinary colleagues decided to set up a new population research site in 1999 called Javita. Covering a size of four times Washington, D.C., we set up this site in 2001, working with the, the Bangladesh Ministry of Health, supported by USAID and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We enumerated a population of over 650,000 people living in 600 village clusters. We opened 60 field offices, recruited and trained 800 field staff to be able to, to enroll 300 pregnancies per week so that we could study ways to reduce maternal and neonatal mortality and improve the health of populations across, as Keith likes to say, the greater Gangetic floodplain. For 23 years, this site has produced groundbreaking research in nutrition, infectious diseases, growth, and in health systems. Over 160,000 women have contributed, contributed their stories to help identify new efficacious interventions. Now we've complete, completed eight large uh, community trials in this site. Over the first decade of Javita, we learned a lot about pregnancy experiences with incredible accuracy from birth weights on day one to details about care-seeking behavior and mortality experiences. Rolf Clem and his colleagues uh, showed that 50% of newborns in 2007 were low birth weight. 22% of neonates were born preterm, the combination of which places them at incredibly high risk of mortality when you consider more than 50% of the mothers delivering at home. The biggest tragedy in all of this is that most of these deaths occurring in the first week of life are preventable. We have strategies to save newborn lives. We just can't get these solutions to the families who need them in time. 
And there's ample evidence that if pregnant women receive at least one, but ideally eight, WHO prescribed antenatal care visits and postnatal care visits after birth, this mortality can be brought down by at least 55%. Existing community-based approaches to try and increase the coverage of ANC and PNC visits have not been dramatically effective. We performed detailed studies of community health worker burden and workflow, documenting how community health workers in, in the Bangladesh government system are responsible for between 1,000 to 2,000 families making work prioritization and equitable coverage impossible challenges to overcome. Community health workers are also relied on for the collection of primary service level and population health indicators, adding to their service delivery burden. And it's difficult for them at this kind of situation to visit families on time when interventions are likely to have the greatest impact. One thing we documented was that community health workers carry up to four kilograms of paper registers, and they only submit aggregated monthly information to their supervisors, making real-time supervision very, very difficult to achieve. Supervisors are challenged to keep track of the progress of community health workers, and they're unable to know when people at the last mile are being missed. But it's important to appreciate that this is not just a supply side problem. Families feel disconnected from the health system since they cannot trigger care, but are subject to seemingly random visits from health workers. Access to emergency obstetric care is limited, even across the vast area we cover in Javita, shown here in a systematic facility readiness analysis we did in 2015, showing how this vast population had only basic or emergency obstetric care on its outskirts. So it's hours of travel for most families. Remember this pink area is four times Washington DC and for you Balmer folks, uh, it's about two Balmers. So just keep it in, in perspective. We further analyzed care seeking behaviors in this study, looking at women who nearly died in the course of delivery, also known as near misses, showing that 75% of women seek care from the informal, untrained providers in their community, less than half of whom progress to skilled providers after that initial visit. So Diwakar Mohan and Lena Khan recently produced this beautiful Sankey plot showing the complexity of the antenatal landscape in rural Bangladesh, notably the sharp drop off in the proportion of women who make it to the second or third or even fourth ANC visit. This when WHO recommends how many? Eight contact points in pregnancy. But you can also see in the turbulent waves of color, the, the even among women who do get multiple antenatal care visits, that they jump from one kind of provider to another, really showing the pluralistic nature of the primary care landscape. But the best public health insights come from listening. Listening to the stories told by people. In this case, an infant verbal autopsy, one of the many hundreds and hundreds we read through during Javita 1 and Javita 2, led by Keith West and Rolf Clem. A young woman says, when I tried to give birth, the umbilical cord came out first. The dai, the traditional healer who was helping me, called two other trained dais. They were afraid to touch me because they said they had never seen anything like this before. Two hours later, my family called an ambulance, but the baby was already dead, probably from the cord being wrapped around its neck for a long time. It's still hard to read these accounts uh, 20 years later, imagining the pain experienced by these, these families. Here's a case of a maternal verbal autopsy. And, and I can pause for a moment to allow you to read it with me and you'll see how the delays manifest. First, the untrained provider, the inability to provide adequate care near the home, the lack of transportation and resources to get the woman care in time. 
a simple deconstruction of another maternal verbal autopsy with each negative situation given a minus one point illustrates a mother experiencing preeclampsia and not realizing the severity of the symptoms. The husband being informed late because he was working away from home. The mother-in-law pressuring them to stay home, seeing a village doctor first, but not being able to pay for care. So they turn to a faith healer or Kobiraj, who recognizing the need to refer sent her to the local hospital, pushing them upwards a little bit. And then who referred her to a private clinic but by which time it was too late and she died. And by the time positive action is taken, so many de negative delays have occurred, wasting that precious time. So as one of my professors, Alvaro Munoz, would say to us as young epidemiologists to be, when I was sitting in these seats as a young student, to remember that behind all data is human life and that always deserves careful and respectful treatment. We have to think about what we see in the data and let it guide where we go next in our science. But we began to notice in the mid 2000s that things were changing. Until 2005, making a simple phone call to Dhaka, or God forbid, Baltimore, meant driving 30 minutes to a Landsat station, booking a call and waiting for the, literally the spaceships to align so that we could send those messages. Emails, if we could hold the line long enough, were dispatched one at a time before the signal dropped. Usually what we would do is scribble a note on a piece of paper, hand it to a runner who would survive a three hour round trip death ride on a killer bus to get answers from a field station that was only 40 miles away. <sighs> but by 2007, we started to see cell phone towers pop up around our study site like mushrooms with phone ownership doubling to 45% in just three years. We also began to see phones pop up in the near miss accounts. For example, this first young woman experiencing obstructed labor, when the traditional birth attendants realized they could not handle the delivery, they phoned the family welfare assistance for advice. She told us to go straight to the government hospital where I received an emergency C-section. Another young woman who was experiencing postpartum hemorrhage says after delivery, I lost so much blood that the village doctor could not make it stop. He used his mobile phone to call an ambulance to immediately take me to the maternal and child welfare center. We began to study this systematically as part of a near miss analysis, finding that half of near misses between 2007 and 10 used a phone during the obstetric crisis for a range of support services, mainly to call a provider or to get medical advice. This gave us the courage to try and see if we could use cell phone based labor notification as part of a study led by Parul Christian here to get a skilled team to the home during or shortly after delivery. The answer was an overwhelming yes, 89% of births were attended. Of course, these were research, not health system workers uh, with vehicles available uh, and drivers 24 seven. We also looked at cell phone ownership, which didn't seem to make a difference. Given the widespread availability of phones in the local community, you could find a phone to make a call if you needed to. So as Al Somer says, don't be afraid to dig into the raw data, to feel it, to smell it, to touch it, to think about it, and let this lead you to new discoveries. So without burdening you with another Star Trek pun, but we thought, how do all of these insights come together in a bold new idea? Could we harness what was happening in the wild and create a structured intervention? Could we develop a system that was able to support women delivering largely unassisted at home? Could we navigate the complexities of gatekeepers such as husbands and mothers-in-law standing in the ways of timely care seeking? Could we support overwhelmed health workers who struggle to deliver services across vast rural areas of the community. So with a seed grant from UBS Optimist Foundation and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we designed this simple system using low cost, locally available smartphones to see if we could conduct, first of all, a population census to capture a true denominator, which is something we all do as epidemiologists, to conduct systematic pregnancy surveillance and send antenatal care reminders to families, but also to allow families to inform us when births have taken place, so we could respond especially to preterm births. 
we worked with a local software company called Empower to develop a prototype version of a system that we called MCARE. We also began engagement with the Ministry of Health. The process of groundwork and technical development took almost two years to complete, with almost a full year of, wait for it, IRB reviews before we received approval. And as our colleague uh, Kate O'Brien mentioned in her Dean's lecture uh, almost a decade ago, it's always painful to compress four to five years of work into a single slide. But uh, there were adventures here that were as wonderful as well as challenging, working through terrorist attacks, death threats, uh, expat evacuations, and all kinds of things that we look back uh, with fond memories. Uh, jumping ahead, a lot of the implementation challenges and months of delays from technical and geopolitical difficulties, the results were surprising even to the most optimistic among us. We found antenatal care tripled and postnatal care doubled among the women in the intervention arm supported by digital technology. Granted, this was done in the hands of our highly trained research workers, so a lot of the unpredictability of the health system was controlled. But looking closely at the types of services women in the control and intervention arms received, we saw clear differences in intervention women receiving more routine services and control women receiving specialized services like ultrasound that are usually reserved for more complex cases. We also noted that newborn danger signs were significantly lower in the intervention arm compared to the control group. And although not statistically significant, this study began to show the early signs of an impact on neonatal mortality that not only excited us, but also our funders quite a bit. This idea of using phones to support community health workers began to gain a lot of traction. MCARE was recognized, as Ellen pointed out, as one of the top 11 innovations in digital health at a global level, competing against about 30 different country projects. With colleagues at WHO, we published in science a Tanahashi framework to explain how digital interventions could act across layers of the health system to drive us closer towards universal health coverage targets. We used strong models born here at Hopkins, such as LIST, to estimate how many lives interventions like MCARE, when scaled, could save. These pilot data and the global interest we were generating in our work suggested that Bangladesh had all of the ingredients to try and see if we could measure MCARE at larger scales, working more intimately with government. We had attracted the interest of the World Health Organization, of UNICEF, and we were enthusiastic about generating evidence of effectiveness of digital health interventions, something that was extremely sparse back then. At the end of 2014, with MCARE One coming to a close, the CEO of UBS Optimus and our program officer Dr. Anne-Marie Sevchik came to visit our field site in Bangladesh and were duly impressed, as everyone is, by the scale and intricacy of the work of these phenomenal 800 people. A few surprise elephant appearances may have been involved to sort of amaze the CEO, but that's a story for another time. The bottom line is they were convinced and willing to fund a large-scale implementation trial. With great enthusiasm, we embarked on our five-year plan a three-pronged strategy involving the complete gutting and redesign of the technical platform to meet global software standards, the development of a rigorous research and evaluation plan, and a very, very intimate government engagement, including a somewhat audacious uh, uh, proposal to use government healthcare workers to deliver the intervention. We signed multiple MOUs and operational agreements with the local and national government, as you might imagine, these procedures took a tremendous amount of time and effort, something we underappreciate when we teach uh, global health uh, to, to students here. Um, but every time a new secretary or minister was named, over these many months, it felt like we were beginning the process all over again. And thank goodness for institutional agreements that we could refer to as a starting point. It was at this time that we had the WHO formally engage us as part of a four country consortium to develop a new software global good based on our lessons being learned in Bangladesh and elsewhere. The result of these multi country efforts was known as the open smart register platform. As you can see here, the logo soup continued to grow and more and more people joined forces to be part of this exciting new adventure. While we were slogging away in the field, getting IRB approvals, 
and training healthcare workers and priming the study for the oncoming trial. There were mountains of work being done uh, to build and test this new digital system by technical partners, Empower, ONA, and IRD. But to address the supply side challenges that we talked about, workers needed a system that enables them to capture beneficiary information systematically, that instantly generates their work schedule, like we have happened to us every day when we look at our Outlook calendars, that uh, helps them prioritize who needs which services. They no longer had to remember to look up information from these fat, heavy uh, register books. Instead, clients were prioritized based on risk score and overdue contact using a very user-friendly interface. Supervisors were empowered to identify variations in performance, big holes on a coverage map, and were able to target resources to communities that were inadvertently missed. To address the demand side challenges, we had the system automatically send reminders to families when services were due a week ahead and a day before. We also allowed families to be part of the care they were to receive by allowing them to send text messages to the system, triggering immediate worker responses based on births or when prolonged labor was calculated. To summarize, here are the components of this complex digital health system intervention. You can see here that we had four specific supply side interventions embedded into OpenSRP. That is to say, tasks were color coded and prioritized, showing workers which tasks were the most important for them to try and accomplish in a given day. High risk clients were ramped up on that list based on prioritization score. And once at the household, they had guided workflows to ensure that the components of ANC were either recommended or administered. We had three different components on the, on the demand side, mostly reminders, but also the ability for families to trigger postnatal care or request emergency assistance. The risk score we developed was validated using our prior Javita data, incorporating both maternal characteristics and previous pregnancy history characteristics. But we also felt ethically obliged to ensure that the WHO essential newborn checklist was administered on day one, three, and seven if such a visit did take place, we provided the workers with uh, working uh, thermometers and the screening tools needed to make sure they could evaluate newborns at these early visits. So here's a basic schematic of a newborn trigger. Based on the report of uh, central or peripheral cyanosis, clear recommendations were provided to the family. Now our primary and secondary outcomes were clearly defined and we were slated to be the first digital health trial to ever be adequately powered to measure an impact on mortality. Another extremely time consuming investment was the reconfiguration of the digital system that in and of itself would be a, another lecture of his own and Dewaker would probably be the only one awake during that part of the lecture. But suffice to say, we took meticulous steps to ensure that the technology was interoperable to global standards. So at long last, we were able to launch the trial operations in June of 2016, after two years of technical and political formative activities across all the country partners and multilateral agencies. The trial was to take three sequential phases, first focusing on practical training with the platform, helping us to develop standardized training materials to be used now around the world. And second, a burn-in period where health workers could use the technology to enroll women and iron out any technical problems, but then finally going live uh, with active enrollment once we felt that they were comfortable with the technology. We didn't want their learning curve to get in the way of the actual exposure. The first and second phase were supposed to take between four and six months, according to our grant timeline, <laughs> but they ended up taking over a year and a half. Again, a lesson learned that having patient donors is essential to do real world effectiveness research. We began the process by a fantastic public ceremony where 113 health workers used a, a tombola lottery uh, bucket to pull their randomization allocations from a drum, providing um, high level transparency to who was selected to receive a tablet to help with their work. Now, the trialists in the room always love these slides because this shows how randomization works so beautifully, leading to balance and ultimately highly believable findings. 
we used creative training methods to dr drawn from user centered design, such as vignettes and role playing. We paired strong performers with weaker ones and even identified exemplary performers as peer trainers as a way of trying to identify mechanisms of sustainability going forward once the research project was over. We had clear benchmarks of competence that the workers had to meet before we would classify them as certified to go live. So as you can hopefully tell, why belabor all these protocols? Because everything was done by the book. We told ourselves that if we're gonna have the audacity to teach and establish standards for global digital health, we should be able to eat the soup that we cook. And, and so we wanted to really test to see if, if what we were recommending as gold standards were possible to do in the field. We held six monthly refresher trainings in addition to field troubleshooting by an active team of five responders. Performance was monitored weekly so that we could identify problems early and be sure to tackle the ones that were technical in nature. In this example, you can see we identified early on that birth notifications were leading were, were, were delayed, leading to delayed early newborn visits. Initially, as many as 40% of births were being notified at, at, on the after the first day. And we were able to increase that to nearly 75% after continuous troubleshooting and field advocacy. But working with government, as you can imagine, <laughs> was no cakewalk. There were many uncertainties related to staffing, competing priorities of other, other government activities, variable motivation and aptitude, supervisory variability, and constantly shifting political support, making it very difficult for folks like Kelsey Allen and Hashmat Ali, who were constantly putting out fires as project implementation faculty. This to me is one of my favorite visualizations, highlighting the tremendous variability across the intervention clusters of health worker dependability. As you can see here, the green bars represent workers who were present and working in their area for the entire time they were assigned to that randomization cluster. Whereas the red and orange and yellow bars indicate periods of time when workers were on leave or ill or simply not assigned to that village after being transferred out for whatever reason. So this left no doubt in our minds whatsoever that if the, the findings of this trial would be reflective of real world health system vagaries where, where implementers have, have little control over the dynamics and politics of the health system workforce. Over time, things got a little better as we engaged local government leaders in monitoring the efforts and receiving feedback on performance using data generated by the system. We were trying to avoid the problem of helium data. We often saw with projects where where data floated up, but never came back to inform workers on the ground. Now, the beauty of the research infrastructure, however, was that we had a research layer underlying this entire implementation landscape, allowing us to capture an unbiased measure of the exposures and the outcomes in both intervention and control arms. So in this figure, there are 113 workers distributed across the study area, the government workers, mind you. And here we see overlaid on that distribution, the network of Javita research workers capturing exposure and outcome events with much greater resolution and dependability. So this complex research information system was in place that allowed us to capture information on when women became pregnant, when they received care, if they received care, the content of that care, and whether or not they were visited by a government health worker in the last several weeks. We captured detailed information on morbidities, nutritional patterns, etc. So all that being said, what did we learn? After completing almost 125,000 household visit enrollments, identifying 15,800 pregnancies and following 14,000 live born infants, we had a few more workers in the intervention group the trial accrued pregnancies and outcomes as expected. We had 162 deaths in the control arm and 196 deaths in the intervention arm. But the comparison tables show us that the process of randomization worked beautifully, despite all the challenges of delivering the intervention across age, gestational age at pregnancy identification, nutritional status, education, poverty, and risk score, 
women were comparable across arms. There are no significant differences across all these other categories, except to note that literacy, notably women's literacy in Bangladesh, has just improved dramatically over the decades, here with over 80% in both arms. Nearly 95% of homes report cell phone ownership. And 50% of that time, 50% of that time, it's the women who hold the phones. So we did an intent to treat analysis of pregnancy and mortality outcomes. As expected, given the timing of miscarriages and the relatively late care seeking in this population, we saw no impact on miscarriages. Despite our best hopes, we also did not detect a difference in neonatal mortality. However, we saw a highly significant reduction in perinatal mortality of 20%, largely driven by a substantial reduction of 26% in stillbirth in the intervention arm. Here we see the outcomes compared with confidence intervals. Again, the impact clearly in the stillbirth and perinatal mortality outcomes. When we dig deeper to see what's happening, we see the bulk of the impact is driven by the 4,500 women who were in the highest risk group, representing 30% of the population, where that difference between the intervention and control arms was the most substantial. The same difference is seen when stratifying women by government assigned vulnerable group status. It seems MCARE was the most impactful among the most vulnerable in this population by high risk group or by socioeconomic status. We found slight but significant improvements in these groups in the number of ANC visits and a 12% difference in early ANC coverage attributed to MCARE among the most uh, vulnerable women in these communities. So the journey is far from over, and by this I mean our, our journey, not yours in the audience. <laughs> We've come a long way from when we started Javita in 1999 and the days of uh, satellite dish phone calls. And when I was honestly, honestly, and Keith has the paperwork, ready to look at carrier pigeons as a viable communication option for Javita project. Today, all of our research workers are equipped with smartphones for data collection, and OpenSRP is now a recognized global good that's being used across 23 countries, many at national scale, for example, in Bangladesh, Tanzania, and Liberia, and by over 30,000 health workers with over 100 million beneficiaries registered in Bangladesh alone. And this is thanks to the continued hard work of partners ONA, Empower, and BRAC, among others, working to scale open SRP around the globe. And Keith, I know when you hired me, we always had a question about, did you really want to enroll 67,000 pregnancies or 6,000 pregnancies? But I guarantee you that zeros on this number are not mistaken. The lessons from MCARE were used to inspire digital health guidelines issued in 2019, and our work with the Ministry of Health aligns with the just released global strategy on digital health. Many of the lessons we learned in fielding MCARE form the basis for WHO guidance as found in this m and &E toolkit released by WHO. But lastly, I want us to remember that we're working to solve complex, nuanced problems. Human systems are complicated and technologies won't solve all of the pain points to get us to dramatically curb neonatal mortality. We need more human resources, financial resources, and working facilities to make inroads in the coming years. Let's revisit the elephant a moment. Not, not the one Anne-Marie met in the, in the field, but the elephant in the room that we have to recognize that, that digital can, if, if not carefully introduced, exacerbate existing inequities. The digital systems don't work in a, a vacuum and depend on other systems, brick and mortar systems and human systems to work. That digital can uncover variability in worker performance or the lack of performance. And most importantly, we have to identify and mitigate the biggest elephant of all. 
profitability of this function. Who stands to gain from the status quo? I say let's embrace elephants. The inherent complexity of solving health system problems and boldly go forward with new ideas to try. We can imagine, we can dream, but we cannot know what exciting things the future holds. This has changed our world in ways that even Gene Roddenberry could not have imagined 55 years ago when he conceived his future Star Trek world. We should remain open to the possibilities and try to solve problems in ways that make economic, ethical, and scientific sense, not shy away from adventures and the lifelong thrill of learning new things. It's been a real joy to be with you all today in person and all of you virtually. And my dad was always proud of this family that I am a part of. Thank you very, very much. Well, thank you a lot. It, it was fantastic, incredible, inspiring. Um, it, it was a, a just, just wonderful. I, you know, I'm most familiar more recently with the work you're doing um, around COVID and um, the amazing things you're doing. And that's um, work we do on the side. <laughs> and that's the work that she does on the side. <laughs> but, and I knew of your work uh, here, but I had never um, heard the full story. And it was just, it really, you brought it to light. It was just fantastic. So we do have um, a few minutes for questions. Um, and what we're gonna try something new. So first I'll, I'll turn to the audience here for questions. And I know Keith, I'm sure you have um, multiple questions, uh, <laughs> but um, also I can turn to our online audience. <coughs> and if you'd like to ask a question, um, if you could um, send a, a, a chat, a private message to Becky Newcomer and she'll call on you and we'll highlight you and you can actually ask your question as opposed to just texting questions. Great. So, yeah. We'll see. I have questions in the room first. Wow. Sure. Um, Please, Chris. And, and so, so great to hear it all laid out. I wonder if you could just briefly talk about, I know you've been somewhat involved and Bangladesh is really amazing uh, welcoming of, you know, 750,000 Rohingya uh, from, from the civil conflict in Burma and, and how that is affecting, you know, the politics and, and, and the politics. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a very uh, challenging question. I do want to make sure I get a visa to travel next week to Bangladesh. So um, let me answer it carefully. Uh, you know, Bangladesh has, has, I think, historically been tremendously resilient. Mm -hmm. There's one word to describe the people and, and, and even the government uh, across administrations. There's been a resilience to bouncing back from, from tremendous disaster, whether it's man-made or, or natural. And so I think the way in which the, the Bangladeshi spirit embraces challenges, there's this word that I love to use called bebosta, which is just to, to make things happen. There, there's, a, there's, a, there's a culture of, of problem solving, of trying to find a, a way out of, uh, of sticky situations. And, and I would say, you know, to welcome that magnitude of humanity into a country that's already struggling to meet its basic uh, uh, public health requirements uh, is, is difficult. But, but the fact is Bangladesh did, did do that. They welcomed in the Rohingyas. They, they uh, set up services and provided, uh, they, there's a, the, the Ministry of Health has an entire data portal dedicated to monitoring uh, the health of the Rohingya population. So it's certainly an imperfect solution, right? Because the, the resources are, are, are strained, but I think there's been a lot of influx of, of resources from international aid agencies to support that population. Um, and it continues to be, to be something that, that is, needs to have a diplomatic solution at the end of the day, right? So, so it's a mix of 
the humanity is there, right? The, the welcoming of, of these refugees is certainly something that, that Bangladesh did uh, without reservation. But I think it's, it, they, these things have real costs that have to be figured out um, uh, in, in struggling economies. So please. Uh, yeah. um, sort of take back on Chris's point, I mean, not focus on Bangladesh and Rohingya per se, but it seems to me, and first of all, thank you for that extraordinary presentation. I guess my sense is technologically, so many advances have occurred in public health and the ability to communicate uh, rapidly, cheaply, vital, um, life-saving, potentially life-saving messages. At the same time, we're seeing human community as fragile as it's not ever been in human history, certainly, but we're seeing a breakdown in, in cohesiveness. We're seeing um, negative viewpoints amplified by technology. And I'm not saying your conversation isn't about what's wrong with Facebook or what's wrong with, you know, social media per se, but can you talk a bit about sort of the dystopian side? What are some issues and challenges that have come up where technology needs to be utilized, but what are the boundaries that, that, that perhaps only humans can ultimately navigate and say, we have to set standards, we have to have judgments about who is using these technologies wisely and well, and who's perhaps misusing them to create disinformation and foment violence and, um, and division. I, I think, Court, that's a, it's a fantastic question. And, and, and I think you, you've nailed it on the head. This problem of misinformation and the leveraging of technology to spread misinformation rapidly through populations to create discord it is not just a, a, a political problem. It's, I think, uh, Ellen, one of the key public health priorities for the next decade. It, it's erosion, eroding trust in science, trust in fundamental interventions like vaccines to levels we have not seen for, for decades. Um, and it's not just limited to high income populations. The fact that 95% of women in the communities in Gaibanda have access to phones and not just candy bar phones, but actual smartphones. That means they are able to receive these types of uh, false messages and misleading information. So I think it, it is cert it, it's certainly contingent on us to figure out how we as a public health community contribute to that fight. And it genuinely is a, is a fight. Um, I, I joke with uh, Rupali LeMay, who's one of our experts on misinformation, that, that we really need to see this as, as a battlefront because the folks who are coming in with whatever dubious uh, malign interests to this, this, this problem are doing so with a vast amount of resources, right? Destabilizing global economies and, polit and political parties has, has huge uh, financial value to these folks. So we need to be fighting back with the same you know, vim and verve that, that they are bringing to the, the, the misinformation side of the equation. So, you know, we saw in the early days of cell phones how these technologies are fundamentally democratizing technologies, right? They, they bring information to populations. I remember when we were talking with the, the Minister of Health of South Africa about um, the, the, the folks from the telecom companies were saying, how can we develop an RLI model for giving pregnancy information to, to pregnant women you know, during their gestational period? I mean, the minister said that he sort of listened to these uh, deliberations about how you can pay for it. He stood up and said, well, it was actually the advisor to the minister. He said, this is a human rights issue. It's not access to information for a pregnant woman and how to experience a, a safe pregnancy isn't a question of ROI, just a fundamental right for the country of South Africa. And so they funded this national project that's now available to every pregnant woman uh, called MyConnect, where they can register as early pregnancy and receive free text messaging and interact with the chatbot during uh, So we need to leverage AI, we need to leverage new technology. Uh, the, the grant challenges, the Canada Group are, are funding a number of uh, AI technologies that will automatically identify and tag misinformation to be able to, to accelerate our ability to combat these things. But I think, you know, this thing 
psychology is neither good nor bad. It's really what we do with it. And I don't think setting controls or, or um, limits on what technology should be used for is necessarily the answer. And people are always going to find their way around the control. But I think what we do need to do is, is understand the malign forces and react against them and proactively stop them in the gate. So speaking of technology, I'm, I've been asked for you to come oh, yes, and to, speak uh, into the microphone to, here. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, I, I am a ro roamer, so I apologize for walking away from the, uh, okay. the microphone. We do have two questions um, from online. So first, Kellen Schwab. Hey, Alon. I don't know if you guys can hear me okay, but fantastic talk. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Fantastic talk. Um, I'm going to go utopian, not dystopian. So um, as someone who works in water and sanitation, you know, we've been able to do the coattails of what's been going on in that in the maternal health and, and family planning. Where do you see this going? How how big a scale? If you're Dean Roddenberry too and putting on your hat there in 50 years, what kind of scale can we go to with this? And how can that make sure that we don't forget those marginalized populations as these technologies evolve? If we're in a smartphone 12 coming up, are we going to lose the ability to maintain this kind of momentum you've gained? Or is it going to be able to build continuously as we advance here? So Kellogg, I'll, I'll pay you later for asking the perfect question. Thank you for that. But I'll say two things uh, because the, there's many possible answers for that question. For the last 10 years, and I were just talking with, uh, with the Walker about this earlier, this in my hand, the size of one of those disposable pocket calculators is a, is a mobile phone. Its price point is less than $10. Why is this not a routine component of every antenatal care package that we provide women, a birthing kit, if you would, right? Where we in integrate, we find a way to cover the cost of the technology itself and the airtime that's requisite to make connectivity and access to information a routine part of every pregnant woman's journey in countries where it's needed. So I think, I think for years we've been fighting this battle to say, you know, let the, let the market shaping, shaping uh, create the, the coverage of phone availability and access. But that's where you leave out that last mile. And I think if we have to provide phones, the technology is at a point where these are disposable and, and where we can provide phones that, that gives life-saving access to every pregnant woman, irrespective of her socioeconomic status. The other exciting thing that I will jump to here is we have the power to potentially disrupt the way we deliver services in rural parts of the globe, where we've been uh, hostage to the, the sort of British empire notion of, of um, catchment areas, where a worker is responsible for 100, 200, 1,000 families. Why not open that up to a system that is, and, and we've been working on the technology behind this now for, for almost two years with funding from the Johnson and Johnson Foundation. But think about Uber as a model, not necessarily the company, but as a model where entrepreneurial individuals, motivated individuals sitting in their vehicles can, can be notified that there is a task to be completed. A uh, passenger needs a ride from Baltimore to Dulles. They're able to capture that task, complete the task, and be rewarded then and there for having done that task. So we're working on a similar type of, of approach to deconstructing the complex uh, battery of activities that surround pregnancy, that surround HIV care, that surround uh, malaria, so you can identify discrete tasks that need immediate attention and allow motivated workers to take those tasks on and do them in a timely fashion, but also be rewarded immediately with those uh, with for their work. And so I think these kinds of disruptive ideas that challenge the status quo that challenge how we've done things will help us overcome these challenges where we have vast swaths of the, the countryside that are hostage to workers who are unmotivated or unavailable. 
and, and really empower people to be responsive to the needs of, of the clients and beneficiaries in real time. And so it, 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 there's a whole sort of layer of potential health economics uh, that, that can be explored to think about rewards and incentives and bonuses based on the performance of workers. Uh, drawing in feedback from clients is a completely neglected area that we need to be paying attention to. Um, and so all of this really is looking at a way to, to disrupt the way we've been delivering public health services for 200 years, um, potentially leveraging technologies that know not only where you are, but who you are, and direct you to where you need to be to provide care to people. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question, and I'll call on Jean Sack. Yes, Alain, has the government of Bangladesh then taken up some of this um, um, baton and implemented more M Health among their community health workers, their clinics, and their uh, sub district clinics or hospitals? Yeah, so it's a great question, and and as I shared in the in one of the last slides, yes, um, uh, BRAC is now has over a hundred. Right. Beneficiaries registered as part of their national health care program. As you know, they work very intimately with the government in delivering services at the at the rural levels of the country. But the, the Ministry of Health has for, for many years, and this is why we were so excited about working in close partnership with them, um, really embraced innovation and technology as a way of addressing some of these in, in you know, uh, intractable challenges that have been uh, frustrating for so many, so many decades. So, uh, you know, I'm very, I'm very eager to see what Bangladesh uh, does. They've been using uh, work that that actually comes out of the school here. Dustin Gibson's work with the Data for Health uh, to do national surveys of people on their mobile phones as part of the national COVID response. And so, so it's exciting to have countries like Bangladesh, like Rwanda, like South Africa, that are, are eager to, to embrace the potential of what technology can do um, in a systematic, evidence-based, and, uh, and economically sensible uh, way. So I'm, I'm very hopeful, but you know, I'm an uh, impatient optimist. Is, is <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank goodness for your impatience um, and your rigor. I mean, I think that's the other thing that's so impressive um, with this work is that you you study it and you study it in a very rigorous way and you get answers that people then can use to change policy and, and programmatic efforts. So again, um, uh, no, typically, you know, after one of these events, we'd all go to the wall of wonder and um, have a beverage and some food. Unfortunately, we can't do that um, yet, but we're getting there. We're getting there. So, um, we're going to raise our cups. Text message people, pictures of. Yeah, the, well, we could do that. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure how gratifying that would be, but. Uh, <laughs> Um, but I, I do want to thank everybody for coming here in person and <clears throat> online, and in particular, thank you, Alain, um, for an outstanding presentation and incredible work. And I really look forward to how, how many years should we give them? I think even five years, we could see a lot uh, forward. What, what is that? No, I said it takes time. It takes time. Yeah. All right, we'll give them 10 years. <laughs> but it'd be exciting to see, I mean, especially the last uh, set of comments you made about the future and, and what we could do um, uh, to really change, uh, change the world in such a meaningful way. So we look forward to all the great things that will, um, will come. So thank you. Thank so much, you. Ellen. Thank yes. you all. Yeah. Feel free to come and browse some of these uh, memory memory lanes. <laughs> this one over here is Keith's sort of childhood phone. I borrowed it. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> it's a cell phone where you can look at the cover, and the cover says "Made in USA." <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, yeah. More roll. One of those.